1930, Archer Huntington purchased a, a large plantation known as Brook Crane for himself and his wife Anna to have a winter house. They decided to name this structure Adelia, is how it's pronounced, and this is a Spanish term which means watchtower. In 1931, construction began on Adelia. The workers uh, took about two to three years to build this structure, and Mr. and Mrs. Huntington were very adamant that local labor from Georgetown County would be used because this was during the Great Depression and they wanted to support the local economy. The building itself is basically a four-sided square with a hollow interior that consisted of two very large courtyards. The home itself had 30 rooms and the centerpiece of it was the 40-foot tall watchtower or the Adelia in the middle of the courtyard. Archer and Anna Huntington utilized this, this winter home until 1955 when Archer passed away. Once Anna had no use for her studio in South Carolina at Adelia Castle, she decided to lease this land to the state of South Carolina in 1960. Since then, this has been part of the state park system. Let's now take a guided tour through Adelia Castle, which is located in the Huntington State Park in Georgetown County, South Carolina. Constructed in 1931, this was Anna and Archer's vacation home and art studio for Anna's sculptures. room of the house we're going to look at is the garage. Uh, the Huntingtons at the time of the Depression were lucky enough to actually have recreational vehicles and this is where they housed them. Uh, currently in the garage it's a, a small museum with pictures and explanations of the designer of the home, uh, the history of the Huntingtons, uh, and whatnot. The uh, funny thing about this garage is that they would drive all the way from Connecticut with their customized vehicles, along with all their animals, their pets, uh, their dogs, their birds, their monkeys. So I, I would imagine by the time they arrived here, it was probably literally a zoo in their garage. In the garage museum, you can learn about the, the history of the Huntingtons and the actual construction of the home. These pictures are original photographs from the construction. The home is actually funded by Archer Milton Huntington's father's company. The Collis P. Huntington Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company. That's a mouthful. This is an interesting fact about this building. In the 1930s, we were going through the Great Depression, and Georgetown County was getting hit hard. But the Huntington family actually employed the largest workforce at that time in this area. So thanks to their construction activities, you got paved roads in Georgetown County. And William Thompson, this man right here, he is the one that managed the workforce and really built this southern castle. Before we move on to the main building, let's stop by the stables real quick. Anna Huntington loved animals and her sculptures showed that. These stables held three horses, uh, one horse for Anna, another horse for Milton, uh, and a third horse that was described as an old hopeless stallion starved and wretched. She took this horse and nursed it back to health and kept it basically as a pet. And back there are some bear cages, but we'll get to those bear cages later. Just imagine it's the 1930s and this is the front door you walk into. And the first thing you see is this amazing corridor that runs right through a watchtower with a water tower up above. This is their courtyard. This was their living room slash yard, if, uh, if you want to think of it that way. 
Nowadays, it is very common to have weddings in this exact courtyard uh, and all sorts of other ceremonies. It's really a beautiful location. As you can see, early in the morning when no one's there, it's very tranquil, very relaxing. It's one of the few beautiful southern structures in this area that you can still explore and physically touch and enjoy. Before we get to the real nice quarters, let's go ahead and go through the servants' quarters. This was the laundry drying yard. When this was operational, they would have a pulley system strung across this courtyard and laundry would be hanging in it. And this door to the left right here, oh, there it goes. But anyway, it's public restrooms today, but that was actually the living quarters for the launderer that worked this yard. Uh, as we walk up this incline and we look over, we can actually see some of the existing hardware, uh, original hardware, when they strung up the laundry back as far back as the 30s. It's really fascinating to think about actual laundry hanging in that space as you walk through it. Of course, adjacent to the hanging courtyard, there's the laundry room. So there would be servants in here washing and ironing the linens. There would have been a sink, a wash tub, and a hang cranked uh, washer slash ringer in this exact room. So you can imagine a, a workforce in here taking care of all the linens of the home. Now we're getting into territory that really is reminiscent of if you've ever seen Downton Abbey. This is the housekeeper's room. Uh, her name was Annie McKinnon. She was the head housekeeper and she was actually immigrated from Scotland like, like a lot of the Huntington staff specifically for this job. She was so integral to the operations in Huntington that she actually traveled uh, to Adelaide uh, prior to the Huntingtons arriving and actually hired local work, trained them, got them prepared, so when Anna and her husband arrived, everything would be ready to go. And speaking of servants and, and, and hired help, this was uh, one of the bathrooms uh, on the servants' side of the house. Uh, plumbing was not original to this structure. This came in uh, many years later. Uh, same with uh, telephone service. The Huntington's really wanted this home to be an escape. So they wanted it to be very old, very classic, where there was no telephone, no, uh, no plumbing. They did have running water later on, when, and they put it inside the tower, which you'll see in the courtyard later. But this was purposely, for the time, off the grid. It was a relaxation for them. This was not a permanent home. They resided up in Connecticut primarily, but when they came here, it was relaxation. All of this that we're still seeing, this is all servants' quarters. There were, I believe, four servants' quarters bedrooms and then two separate bedrooms, uh, one for the cook and one for uh, Annie McKinnon, the head of the housekeepers. And this was their hallway. This is the north side of the house. The house is split. The north side was the servant's side. There's more servants' rooms. Notice they look exactly the same as the others. And the south side of the house was the residence. So there was a split between um, the servants and the residence. Uh, much like an old traditional English home where you'd have the upstairs and then the downstairs. Again, a reference to that Downton Abbey style where it was like two different worlds. I imagine it was very similar here. Uh, this right here was one of their pantries, this large door uh, with the enclosed space with no windows in it. There you go. Some of the shelving there.
Now we are in the kitchen space and you can see the service window right there that they would hand the, the dishes through the dining rooms on the other side there. Uh, we will go around this corner here. Here we go. This was the primary cooking space here. Uh, beautiful view out the window of that courtyard again. Let's take another look at this courtyard. Just amazing. It's, it's a beautiful sight, especially early in the morning uh, before the crowds get there. Anyway, back to the kitchen. This is the kitchen space where they would uh, cook for the Huntingtons and their guests. Uh, tucked back here, as you can see, is a walk-in icebox. Uh, 300 pounds of ice would be stored in this icebox in order to keep their uh, goods uh, cooled off. Uh, so you can imagine at one time there was a sweaty cook and probably a couple of assistants running in and out of this icebox. Uh, cooking up a meal for the Huntingtons and whomever their guest was for that evening. This kitchen at the time of the construction in the 30s was probably a coal burning stove. And it's important to remember that they weren't just cooking for the, the man and, and the lady of the house, they were cooking for the entire staff. Every person, everyone from the individual who trained the horses and scooped the horse crap to Anna herself. There you go, says it right there. A large staff was served out of this kitchen. Uh, so this was a very large operation. And I can't resist not zooming into old rusty metal. I geek out on that kind of stuff. This is looking through the service window into the first portion of the dining room. Uh, that's the hallway out of the dining room, and we'll swing around and look in the dining, the actual dining space. This dining room held a large table that, as the story goes, Anna actually gave their large wrought iron table to a servant when they finally moved out of the house. That, there's the dining room right there. That was that dining space. So from the dining room, this is where everyone would enjoy their meal. As we back up, we go into the dining prep room. And as we back up further, we pass the service window. And now we are in the cook's living space, which is adjacent to the kitchen, of course. This space was also utilized as the general servant's uh, living room as well. And this house, like I said earlier, since the Huntingtons wanted to be traditional, actually had a bell service system. So uh, Anna or her husband could just pull a string from their library uh, or their bedroom and it, they can call upon a servant. Leaving the kitchen space, we're no longer in what I'd consider shared space between the servants and the house. We're going to go toward the south side of the house now. Uh, so we'll see a living room, library, bedrooms, things like that. But before we see that, let's take a, a quick pan back over here to that courtyard, which we will walk through completely later in this tour zip around here. Now this portion of the house I do want to mention has some structural issues right there. We're gonna see a few other telltale signs but first the breakfast room. As the sign states this was their breakfast room. It would have been lined with tapestries. Um, there would have been an open door leading to their patio right here to the left of this window but it is now blocked off. You see that crack running down the middle of the patio there? I'll get to that later. Coinciding with that crack down the patio, you can see this line across the floor. It's hard to tell, but the floor is actually sinking severely in this location. And we will find several structural fingerprints that uh, also depict the sinking. Like this right here above the window. As you can tell, there is extreme shifting in the building. Uh, 
and this crack in the brick is also a little uncomfortable when you're in the building, honestly. But you put your faith in the people who run the place uh, because you notice things like this. This is a way for whomever is inspecting this building to monitor the movement of that crack, the movement of the settlement of the building. That way they can determine if it's safe, unsafe, if it needs repair, things like that. So it's good to see that they are monitoring this building and that we're not, not just walking through a building that could possibly structurally fail at any moment. Welcome to the foyer, or foyer if you're fancy. When you first enter this house, remember the door that said Adelaide? Well, you'd open that door, you'd walk down a long corridor, and this would be the first room that you would enter. So in a moment, I'll, I'll spin around and we'll be looking down that courtyard there. That green door is at the end of that walkway. So you'd come down that walkway, you'd enter this room with a nice fireplace, and then Archer Milton Huntington would be standing there, and his wife, Anna Huntington, would be standing there, and they would greet you, and then whatever the day's events were planned would, uh, would commence. Maybe even something up those stairs. That's actually closed off. Uh, there is no access to the roof uh, and the patios. Now we're entering the south side where the private, the more private rooms are. Around this curved wall is there, I believe it's the tea room. There's a sign in here, it'll tell us. But this is where only uh, special guests would come with them. Uh, they would keep their pet macaw that they would actually travel from Connecticut, uh, New York, uh, down to South Carolina with. So this room was really an escape room. It was a very peaceful room. And at the time, you could look out the front windows and see the ocean, but that has all been grown over since, since the 30s. So you can imagine here uh, a bunch of uh, fancy people sipping tea and talking to their pet bird, if you will. This, this view right here. It would have been unobstructed at the time, but it has grown over. Here's some more of that structural evidence of the sinking I mentioned earlier. There's a lot of it on this side of the building. All right, let's uh, spin over here and head to the library. Um, Archer Milton Huntington actually was a poet and a writer, so this library probably held some of his books. Uh, a interesting fact about their private library it was shared between them and their staff. So it's, it's very appreciated, in my opinion, that the Huntingtons would open up the private side of their home to their staff and uh, treat them as, as family, if you will. And here's some more uh, structural evidence. There's the other side of the patio. We were at the other window earlier, and you can see that crack right down the middle where the foundation is sinking. All right, we're gonna climb these steps and head into even more private space. This was Abby Perkins' office. She was the secretary uh, to the Huntingtons and she traveled with them. Uh, she dealt with a lot of their financial paperwork, business paperwork, uh, correspondence, things like that. She had her own private, be it small, bathroom. Uh, and adjacent to this room was Archer's uh, office slash library as well since he was uh, more in depth with the business than Anna was. So he and the secretary could communicate while, while doing paperwork. Further down this hall, there's a very uh, nice fireplace here. This was Anna's bathroom right here. Uh, the, I don't believe that sink, that specific sink, is original to the home because as the sign says, her bathroom was converted into a kitchen, a secondary kitchen I assume, uh, at one point, but that plumbing is still very old. Adjacent to this bathroom is the master bedroom. This is where the man and woman of the house slept. A uh, fun fact, uh, Archer Milton Huntington was a very tall man for the time, so he had a special bed that was longer than Anna's that he would sleep in and actually fold up uh, every morning and put to the side because it was so large. 
Continuing on that explanation of Archer being so large, this was his shower. It had several custom shower heads. It was very large so that he could shower because most of the prefabricated uh, bath pieces that you could purchase back then just were not tall enough. This was the closet space for the Huntingtons as we pan out here back into Archer's master bath. We'll also turn a corner, go down a small hallway, and see another closet space here. They had plenty of room for whatever they brought with them when they came down on vacation. And like the sign says, this was Archer's study office, personal library, where all his work got done. Back over here is more storage space. Not sure if this was for clothing or for paperwork, but it was adjacent to Archer's study. And we saw Archer's workspace. Let's go down here and see Anna's workspace, because this is where the real interesting stuff took place. The main reason we know of the Huntingtons nowadays is because of what happened in this room and the courtyard on the other side of that doorway. All of Anna Huntington's sculpting and investigating of animals and sketching animals took place in these two spaces under this roof. Majority of her creations that reside in Brook Green Garden across the street, she actually sculpted and created here in this space. This was her artistic paradise where she could do whatever she wanted with her medium. And I think the end results speak for itself. She created some amazing works of art. And if you're really interested in them, uh, you could just Google her name and see tons, or you could visit Brook Green Garden across the street and see them for yourself. Here's the exterior of her studio. Uh, she claimed to enjoy sculpting out here more than inside because of the natural lighting. Uh, so she put her sculptures on uh, rollers uh, and bring them in and out depending on the weather. So you can imagine in this space here, she would have full size, full size, full grown uh, bears, monkeys, basically any animal that you've seen a sculpture of hers, it was in that space and she would uh, sketch it and carve it and it was, I assume, a very, very interesting feat to behold. Aside from animals and sculpting, there's also this magnificent courtyard. This thing is gorgeous. Uh, you've got those green tones in, in the windows, you've got the palm trees, and this tower, this water tower, uh, that was originally constructed uh, in order to house bats. They wanted bats to live in this courtyard uh, to eat the mosquitoes, because this is the low country surrounded by the inlet and the wetlands, so there was a lot of mosquito activity, and those bats would eat them up. So that's, uh, that's a smart move by the Huntingtons. Another interesting feature, uh, along the walkways in this courtyard, there's a little channel to the bottom left of the sidewalks. You can kind of see it right there. Uh, it captures water off the sidewalk so you don't have any pooling. It's very interesting. Also, there's a basement uh, to the right side here, but it is not accessible by the general public. I'm really not sure to what extent uh, that basement goes, how, how large it is. Uh, I assume it was just for storage, but um, if anyone knows, comment down below. Let me know if that, that basement space was functional, because there's another one on the other side. Uh, right now we're on the, uh, the residence side of the building, and over there to the left of where we're looking is the servant side, and there's a basement over there as well.
there on the side of the sidewalk you can see those channels again very nice touch very smart let's go ahead and spin around here and look down there's that there's that tower let's look down that entrance feature again because this is this is really really nice I can imagine the first time you're a guest looking down that uh, is probably impressive to say the least As we walk out of the building, let's take one last look at that front door. That's cool. That's a nice touch. All right, the bear pens. I told you we were going to get back to here. This is where Anna would keep the bears that she liked to use to, to uh, model as a sculpt to. But you might look at these and, and say, oh my gosh, that is inhumane. Look at these little bear cages but the reality is there was a zoo across the street at Brook Green Garden and what she would do is she would have them uh, delivered to her to witness and to sketch and they would only be in these cages for a few hours uh, once she was done they would uh, just go right back across the street to, to the zoo that they actually uh, ran uh, managed whatnot uh, and then next to the bear Pens. This is where they kept all their dogs. This was their dog yard. Uh, or their dog kennels, as the sign says. They had several. The oyster shucking room, they'd be shucking crabs, oysters, shellfish galore on this exact table. Uh, I imagine the smell in this room was probably pretty gnarly with all the, like I said, shellfish being shucked all day long or whenever it was in use. And yeah, that's, that's the table right there. Just imagine it. People working there. Smelling all fresh and good like the ocean. The Huntingtons enjoyed their seafood so much. They had a specific employee. Their sole job was just to get them fresh seafood, whether it was to go to the market and get it or catch it themselves. And here is just some general shots of the Huntington State Park that this building resides in right up against the water. Like I said, originally, before it grew over, they could look out the front windows, and there was the beach, right there.